I'd like to, we're circling, we're, the land of gear is coming down on this Worship Because series. This is actually the 28th psalm that we've taken a look at. We've worked our way through the whole book of Psalm. We are coming real near the end now, and we're approaching the landing strip. And I'd like to preach you a message entitled, Worship Because the Lord is Your Help and Your Hope. Worship because the Lord is your help and your hope. Let's begin with a word of prayer, please. Father, may you shine, may your glory shine this morning. And just may you get you all the victory and all the glory. And sanctify us, Lord. Let true salvation through Jesus Christ be clear. And uh, as we, as most of us, have walked through that door of regeneration... And now we're on the other side. I pray that the glories of you growing us and us seeing you for who you really are would be very clear this morning. And I pray you would fill us with praise and worship. In Jesus' most precious and holy name I pray, amen. I'll never forget that day when Amy and I were first married. We had upcoming bills and I looked at the checkbook. I can still tell you it had a pink cover. And there was only change. What I mean by that is there was less than one dollar. I sunk to my knees at an old white vinyl swivel chair and I cried to the Lord for help. And we did not starve. We'll never forget that day at St. Christopher's Hospital in Philadelphia when our Daniel was only a few days old, diagnosed with meningitis, non-responsive, and we cried to the Lord for his help. To our mind came the verse, the Lord giveth and taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If any of you have been around here a little bit, you know that our Daniel is not dead. And the Lord gave him to us for our joy. Amy and I will never forget sitting at lunch at a local Italian joint discussing how in the world we were going to pay for our children's Christian education. And while we were sitting there having this discussion can't make stories up like this the phone rang on the table my cell phone rang right on the table and a completely an unexplored completely an unexpected phone call came as the answer the financial complete financial answer we cried as we sat in the booth and praised to the lord we'll never forget when our hvac died the death and uh Pastor Pritt tried all he could to revive it. Appreciate that. Some of you know that same experience with Pastor Pritt in your homes. (laughs) By the way, you better pay him when he helps you like that. We had little money to put towards it. The Lord supplied $5,000 in cash from a completely unexpected source. And it was not a loan. The Lord provided. With these stories and so many more, I could tell you of the Lord's help. Our faith still struggles when we are faced in my home with impossible situations. But enough about us. I want to ask you something this morning. Who is your help? and hope who is your confidence in this life when you just can't help yourself worship because the lord is your help and your hope and so turn to psalm 146 please this morning psalm 146 Would you stand as we read, Thus saith the Lord. Psalm 146. Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the sons of men, man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth. That means he loses it. He returneth to his earth. And that very day his thoughts perish. 
Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is therein, which keepeth truth forever, which executeth judgment for the oppressed, which giveth food to the hungry. The Lord looseth the prisoners. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous. The Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the fatherless and widow, but the way of the wicked he turneth upside down. The Lord shall reign forever, even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations. Praise ye the Lord. Would you be seated, please? This psalm opens and closes with bookends, praise ye the Lord. In fact, you can scan ahead just in the little a couple of chapters that we have left, and you'll notice the last five chapters of the book of Psalm all, at, all begin this way, praise ye the Lord. You'll notice that this psalm in particular is a very personal psalm. Some of them we've seen praise him in the sanctuary, praise him in the congregation, whatever. This one says, oh my soul, verse number one. Oh my soul, it's a personal thing between him and the Lord. As the introduction continues, notice in verse 2 it says, While I live, I will praise the Lord. And then it says, While I have any being. That is, you know, while you have any continuance of life. While I'm still alive, I will praise the Lord. Now wait a minute. Think about that a moment. You know, folks, we put so much expectation on what it will be like when we get to heaven and praise God the way that he really should be praised. And we think about, oh, that's going to be the day. Wait till I get to heaven. I'm, I'm going down the glory road when the road is called in glory. You know that song, any of you southern gospel types, you know, uh, I'm not, I don't say much here, but the song says, but when I get there, I'm just going to let it rip. We kind of have that idea sometimes. You know, that then that, boy, I'm really going to praise God when I get in heaven. But wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not what this verse says. This puts the emphasis on praising God right now in your body. Right now, while you have any being, while you have any life, in fact, Folks, listen to me. This is good. You might have never seen this before. This is one of many places in Scripture that deals with this exact idea that now is the time to praise him while you're alive, while you have your body now. It's Scriptures like this. I'm going to read you a couple different ones. Psalm 30, verse number 9. What profit is there in my blood when I go down, in, down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Isaiah 38 says it this way, For the grave cannot praise thee, death cannot celebrate thee, they that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy mercy, the living, the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day, the father to the children shall make known thy truth. Both of these guys in those verses, David and Isaiah, believed in the afterlife. Both of them, by different testimonies and different things that they wrote, believe that they will stand with their redeemer. They, they believe in the afterlife, but they make the point, don't wait until you're on the other side to praise the Lord. Do it now. Praise is valuable now. God needs to be glorified now in earthly worship and praise. Now is the time to open your voice. Now is the time to sing to the Lord. Now is the time to testify to someone else. Now is the time to fall on your face in your prayer closet and weep tears and praise God for how great he is. Now is the time when you're in your body. And you say, well, why is that? Well, let, let me ask you a question. What shows more glory to God? Which shows more glory to God? More dependence, more trust, and a bigger view of God. If, when, you die, whatever, when you will praise him, when you see him face to face in glory, and you see the, the mansions, the streets of gold, and the throne, and all of that, you know, and, and you'll be perfect, whatever, or that, which takes more dependence and shows more faith and trust and a bigger view of God, that time when you'll praise him, or when you're praising him right now in, in darkness by faith. I think you understand. Folks, God is highly glorified that you are praising his word, uh, his truth to you, having faith in him and praising him right now despite dragging around your sinful flesh and praising him in the middle of a dark world and praising him in the middle of your need. God is glorified and it shows great faith and trust in him when we have earthly worship, when we glorify him right now, when we're still alive in our being you know, it's not going to take much faith. It's not going to take much trust in the Lord when you're standing there staring at God in the presence of heaven to praise him. Of course we're going to praise him then. Now is the time that God says, lift up your voice when things are dark. Lift up your voice when you can't see it working out. Okay, lift up your voice when it takes faith. So while you have breath and while you are still alive and while you have any being, the verse says, praise him. Praise him. With that admonition to earthly worship then, we get to the meat 
of worshiping because the Lord is your hope and your help. Point number one is simply this. Don't trust men, trust God. Did you hear that? We have... We all got, don't trust men, trust God. Look at verse three through five. It says, put not your trust in princes, nor in the son of man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth. He returneth to his earth. You know what that, you got that, right? That's like a a funeral verse. You know, you're standing beside the graveside. He goes back to the earth. He goes back to the dust. In that very day, his thoughts perish. The very day he dies. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help whose hope is in the Lord, his God. So don't trust men, trust God. When we're talking about trust and hope and help and confidence in this chapter, folks, we're talking about those needs and those trials and those mountains and those stretchings and those breakings in our life that every one of us either have faced, are facing, or will face where we need help outside of ourselves. How do you handle that? God says don't trust princes or sons of men okay man now wait a minute princes are rich a lot of our problems are money problems princes are rich oh here we go Bumaba Adul Yadej the king of Thailand is worth 30 billion dollars and by the way that's exactly how you pronounce it $30 billion. This guy's worth $30 billion, and the verse tells me not to trust in princes. That guy seems like a pretty good guy to trust. Princes are powerful. They have guards, and they have armies, and they're heads of state, so they can make things happen. You talk about networking, man. They, whooma, bang, a whooma. You know, a, a prince, this, I'm not going to say his name again. I mean, things will happen. God says, don't put your confidence or your trust in princes. It's shaky. It's not near as confident as trusting me. Some of you today are making alliances and you're making friendships and networking with people because you think that they're going to be your help in life. You're putting confidence in somebody you know. Somebody that can help you, you think. No, no, God says don't look to people, even rich and powerful people for your life confidence, your hope, your help. Look to the Lord. Psalm 20, verse 7 says it this way. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. That is our confidence. That is solid ground, not people. You may run to the most powerful, rich people when you get into a bind, and there may be some kind of temporary help there, but friends, there is no lasting security. There is no lasting stability in men. All men will fail you. There's something else, though, and I want you to understand here. Because I look at this, and I think about it. Don't trust in a prince, you know, $30 billion, that guy, Thailand, you know. There's something else here. If a prince would help you, he's only meeting the the momentary present need of dollars or whatever. See, God knows the whole situation and why you're in that situation and why he brought you to that situation. The Lord knows all the reason and situation that you're there And when we trust on him, he works it out in a much greater way to meet all the needs of the situation. Is the Lord that said all things work together for good to them that love God. That prince cannot meet, that powerful person, that, you know, sugar daddy cannot meet all those needs. He does not know all these needs spiritually and emotionally. And the reason that you're going through that, money is the the smallest of the issues of what God is really doing in your life. However, putting your trust in the Lord, the Lord knows your spiritual need and he knows how he needs to mature you and your emotional need and how he needs to connect and and have other people and work in other people's lives to even help you and those kind of things. You know, whatever. No man can do that. No man can be your confidence and your hope. They just can't. They just don't. They're just not equipped. Even though they have $30 billion, they're not equipped to be able to do in your life what the Lord can do. You know, God could cite several reasons here in this passage not to put confidence in men. They let you down, they turn on you, they cheat you, they fail you, whatever, but he doesn't quote any of them. He, he just gives one solid reason not to trust men. Look at verse 4 again. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, in that, he, in that very day his thoughts perish. He gives you one solid reason. God says man can't even sustain his own breath, his own life. So you're going to put your hope and your trust in this life, your confidence in some person 
to help you through this life? That guy can't even depend on the next breath he takes. He can't even make himself inhale. He cannot even know that he's going to be able to breathe 30 seconds from now. He is not as solid as you think. (laughs) He's going to turn into dust and go back to the earth. God says, how can we trust another person to be our solid help, our hope, our confidence in this life when they may stop breathing at any moment? And at that moment, the end of the verse, at that very moment, all their thoughts towards helping you are gone. You know, any networking, anything you put your faith and trust in a person, the moment that they die, it will all be gone. Don't trust men. Don't put your confidence in men. Now, I want you to understand, because you're only getting half of this message, I'm not saying don't trust any people. I'm, ta- I'm talking about putting your confidence in them, your, that they are your hope, they are your help. Some of you here right now may be leaning or running to people for things you should be running to God about. Leaning on boyfriends or girlfriends for your confidence and your help and your significance or, or parents, you know, bailing you out or friends or spouses or even pastors or, or even church people. Folks, listen, ultimately you need to place your confidence in the Lord in your need and in your trials and in your whatever, in your ho- to be your hope. Why is it that we find it so much easier to, ro- to lean on people than on God? getting on our faces before God and crying out for him to be our help? Why is it so much easier that we put faith in some guy or some woman that can help us instead of crying out to the God of heaven, our creator, who's promised us, what else could he promise us? You know, he said it 5,000 different ways that those who are his children through faith in Jesus Christ can call to him and he will answer them. What else can he say to us? Why is it so that we just are so quick, so quick to pick up the phone and go to men. So look at the alternative, please, to trusting in men. Verse 5 says, Happy is he that hath got the God of Jacob for his help. Anybody say amen to that? Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Happy. The Lord chose to use this word happy. It is the most generic form of happy in your Bible. It is just very surface, the general word for happy. There's not very much depth to it. The promise is you will be happy if you make God your help. Well, why? Well, for one thing, you'll see him faithful over the years to meet your needs and to help you through rough decisions and through circumstances, whatever. And that will make you happy. You know, Amy and I can look back, and our family knows of the stories where The Lord has helped us for all these years, being married, 20, whatever it is, it's something, 22, you know, for these years of being married. I got it. I nailed it. I was just a joke. It was, I knew it exactly. It's 22 years, two months and 14 seconds, five seconds. Listen, we can look back and we can see how faithful the Lord has been to us. And we can say, great is your faithfulness. Now, did every situation work out the way the circumstances did in the illustrations that I was telling you at the beginning? No. I think that's part of God's work, too. You know, sometimes God doesn't seem to be so concerned about my timetable or exactly how I want it to work out. And sometimes his answer is more pain than than relief. You, You understand what I'm saying? Okay, we don't mess with God. That's part of the fact of why he can be our help and our hope that he knows completely all that's going on, and he's working all things together for the good. And when that doesn't work together the way that I think it should, sometimes I get sad. And so I'm like, where are you, God? Whatever. I think that he would just like to scream down from heaven, I am working! Be patient! I'm working all around you! All that we would hope in him. Happy. It's a promise that We'll see him faithful, but I, I think it, 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 the promise here of verse number five is not just that he'll work things out, but there's something else. When a, when a person is trusting God and hoping in him and resting in him, instead of being anxious and nauseous and full of care over everything, they are happier. You know, if you are leaning on people or leaning self-reliantly on yourself, and you are full of anxiety and you are anxious and you're nauseous over what you're worried about your your happiness is robbed from you but the one who puts his hope and trust in the lord verse number five is resting in the lord 
just frankly happier. Yes, you can be happy in the middle of a great need or a life upheaval if you'll make God your help and your hope. Trust in him and rest in him. Now notice here, there's no fluff in God's word. It says, happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help. Now listen, that is extremely random. You know, why didn't he say the God of Abraham? Why didn't he say the God of, he could have said God of Moses. Why, why does he specifically choose, this is God the Holy Spirit writing through the psalmist, why does he say the God of Jacob? Do you want to know why? Yes? You want to know why? You want to know why? All right. This is why. Here we go. For much of Jacob's life, he was characterized by self-reliance that did not trust the Lord. If you look at his testimony, and I did, I went back and I, I read his, the account uh, of things that happened in Jacob's life. You'll remember that he was the surplanter. He was born gripping his twin uh, uh, Esau's heel. That self-sufficient scheming characterized from his birth much of his life as he lied and schemed his way along. He was self-sufficient with Laban uh, about Leah and Rachel and worked things with the, you remember, with the flock in the end for his own advantage. He satisfied the wrath of Esau when Esau, he thought, was coming after him by scheming and having this elaborate scheme of sending forth gifts ahead of time and appeasing Esau before he got there, always depending on himself, Jacob was. But then something happened in his life. The Lord wrestled him down. The Lord showed him who was boss. The Lord literally broke Jacob by confronting him. I believe the pre-incarnate son of God, Jesus Christ, wrestled Jacob that day. And he damaged his hip. And uh, from the biblical account, it seemed like he had that pain, he had that dislocation, whatever, for the rest of his life. After that point, things got more confrontational. He, he lost his father Isaac. He lost Rachel, his dear wife. He, he, liter, uh, uh, he lost his favorite son, Joseph. Simeon was held in captivity, and then he had to give up Benjamin. It was during this time of breaking that Jacob cried and in Genesis 42, verse 36. All these things are against me. He just finally cries out as God breaks him. Folks, I believe it says here in this verse 5 that we need to put our hope and help on the God of Jacob because God broke Jacob of his self-reliant scheming until the end of his life in Genesis 48, he called, Jacob called God, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil. I believe God is teaching us in this psalm, and especially by using, put your help in the, in the trust of, in the God of Jacob, that self-reliance has got to go out the window for us. And that depending on men and schemes and things that we can figure out, we, it's got to go out the window, and we need to look above for our help. We need to look at the one, the great creator, the great Jehovah who provided his son for us. We need to look to him to be our help and our confidence. And then verse 5 promises we'll be happy. So, so point one, don't trust men, trust God. But number two, I want you to notice here in the passage, for what reason can we trust the Lord? For what reason? Well, let's get into it from verse 5. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is therein, which keepeth truth forever. Now, there's two points or two reasons in verse number 6 why we can trust the Lord from verse number 5. The first one, he created everything. And the second one, he keeps truth forever. This is still in the idea of why trust God from verse 5. Why can you? Here, he made everything, whatever. So what's this mean? We see two reasons given here why God can be trusted. First, he made all creation. Well, why is that? <laughs> Great. Love it. Love the blue sky. Love the, you know, trees. Love creation. Love the Grand Canyon. Love that stuff. Love the ocean. All that. So why, what's that have to, to do with anything about trusting him when I have a need? Well, in contrast, you remember what the scripture said here about, in verse number four, in contrast to men who can't even create their next breath. In contrast to that, God made everything out of nothing. Now, you're talking about a need. You're talking about a situation in your life that you can't control. You're talking about a mountain you can't climb. You're talking about a stretching you don't think you can go through. You need something created out of nothing. Right? 
So don't look to yourself or to men to do that. There's only one that can do it. The same one that created this world out of nothing. Hebrews 11.3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Isn't that a phenomenal truth? Isn't that a phenomenal poetic way to do it? The things you see, look out the window, look at that big green tree and you know, that sheds all and it's big and the blue sky beyond it. Look at that. That, you know what got, you know what the building blocks was for creation? What, what they were for creation in Genesis 1? One, nothing. See, we make things out of stuff. Legos, you know, even, you know, Papa DuPont, you know, AstraZeneca. They start with something. Chemicals, things, whatever. God made everything out of nothing. So you got an impossible situation. You got a bill and you got nothing. <laughs> you do not know how to work out whatever. There is no help, no hope. There is nothing to start with, nothing substantial. Well, then you better, you better go to the God who knows how to make something out of nothing. Yes? Amen. Amen. God specializes in creating hope and help in impossible situations like yours where you don't know how it could ever be done. If God can fashion the universe out of nothing, he can meet the impossible need of your life. The second reason given here to trust the Lord in verse number six seems disconnected. It's not disconnected. Let's see, you know, again, he's, he's working off of verse five. You're, you're gonna be happy if you, if you make the God of Jacob your help, if your hope's in the Lord. He made creation he made everything and then there's another reason to trust him which keepeth truth forever which keepeth truth forever where keep here means to guard to hedge about and to protect you know it is translated preserve the exact same word in verse number nine it's translated a different word a different way in english preserve in verse number nine same word what's the point here what is the point keepeth truth here in the way that it's used in this verse. What truth is he talking about that he's going to keep or he's going to guard? Well, it's his promises towards you. It's his promises towards, you know, back in verse number five, that you're going to be happy if you put your help in him. He's going to help you if you call upon him, if you trust upon him. He will make good on his promises to help his children, the righteous. Trust him, verse Number five, because he has put a big old holly hedge of pointed protection around the promises he has made to you. They're sure, they're guarded. You can count on them. Verse six, he will keep the truth of helping you. You can rely on what he has said. Isn't that scary though? I'm not saying these things easily. Okay, I'm, I'm saying these as a person that a thousand times over has gripped and fought with his own faith about this matter of God, if God can be trusted, of this own matter of that it's so easy to try to work things out and scheme things out on my own, but can I just simply look to God above and count on him? Can I simply ask, will he really make good? Please, the Bible says he protects that promise of truth towards you. He guards it. He puts a hedge about it. He will keep his promises towards you. We think, well, will God really do this or... Probably God won't do anything to help me. He'll, he'll help the preacher. He'll help the deacon. He helps the evangelist. I've heard those stories. We think this situation is impossible or, or that person will never change. You know, a Christian should never say never. Someone who knows the Lord and has Jehovah as their father should never say never. Should never say, well, this could never happen or that will never. Don't ever say that. Is there anything that God cannot do? We say I'd better find some way to help myself, or God helps those who help herself. Where is that in the Bible? I missed that. I got to find out that verse, because that, that's, that's a lie, okay? We're to go to the Lord for our help. You know, people who say, the Lord helps those who help himself have never learned to trust the Lord, right? I better find somebody to help me, whatever. God says, I guard my truth. I have told you to trust in me. I will be the help your help and your hope. I am the God of Jacob. I can be relied on. Abandon self-reliance. Abandon man-reliance. 
Folks, there really is a God in heaven that didn't spare his own son for you. Listen, this is straight out of the Bible, Romans 8, this logic, this argument. There's a God in heaven that didn't spare his own son for you, but rather has delivered up his son freely for you. And the scripture says, will he not with him, along with him, along with Jesus, freely give you all things? Okay, that's the word. You say, what does that mean? Well, if God gave us the farm, Jesus, everything, the farm, won't he certainly give us a few eggs if we ask for them? He certainly gives us the eggs in his will, his time, his way. I think some of us here need to pound a stake in the ground and say, that's how I'm going to live. By hook or by crook, if it puts me in the ditch or the gutter, I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to let it ride on the Lord. Now notice finally, point number three, when can we trust the Lord? Verse number seven through nine says this. It's just a list, folks. It's this big list. Which executeth judgment for the oppressed, which giveth food to the hungry. The Lord looseth the prisoners. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous. The Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the fatherless and the widow. But the way of the wicked, he turneth upside down. These are just, this is just a big list for our comfort and our encouragement. A list out of the mind of God of situations where he is telling you, you can rely on me. These are, this is not an exhaustive list. There are so many more times in your life that you can trust in him. But this certainly is a variety of situations. Let's look on when you can trust the Lord. The first one, trust God when taken, being taken advantage of. Verse number seven says, which executeth judgment for the oppressed. God carries out judgment and revenge and makes things right when you can. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. So trust him when you're being taken advantage of. Number two, trust God to meet your physical and financial needs. Verse number 7b says, which giveth food to the hungry. We have preached before the many responsibilities of our Lord as he calls himself your father because of salvation through Christ, he takes responsibility for his own. Listen to me, God is not a deadbeat dad. Number three, trust God to release you from bondage. Verse number seven, B says, the Lord looseth the prisoners. This includes everyone from someone unjustly jailed to those in bondage of addictions and substance abuse and drugs and alcohol, addictions of the mind, pornography, thinking disorders, distractions, whatever. Who has the power to deliver prisoners? Well, won't you ask Peter in jail who was pulled out of that jail and the, opened up. It is the Lord who has the power to release the prisoners. You say, you promise too much. No, I say, you believe too little about our God. The one who can resurrect from the dead can change the drunkard's life and release the poor in head. Call out to him for help. He is our only help. There is no help in man. Number four, trust God to heal miraculously. Verse number eight says, openeth the eyes of the blind. Openeth the eyes of the blind. Well, while we are taught clearly in the New Testament that we pray according to his will, we have that great example of Paul who, you know, when he had this, this physical thorn in the flesh, this physical malady, whatever, he asked God three specific times to release him. God says, I'm not going to release you. It's my will that you have that malady. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Many times it is God's will for you to be sick. It is God's will for you to have that whatever. We understand that. And while we understand that uh, the time for apostolic continual healing has ceased, I will not be the pastor who takes away anyone's hope for healing. I believe and I practice anointing with oil, according to James 5.24, and crying for God to heal. I believe that God still performs miracles. I believe that he still heals people. Please be clear and understanding. I will not give a reason why God will not heal you. You understand? I believe you ought to look to him. Cry to him for your healing. The same as the Apostle Paul did in the New Testament. It is faithless to pray and then expect God not to perform miracles. Stop praying. If you don't believe God's going to do anything when you call out, cry out to him for someone's healing, don't mock God and pray for it. 
You understand what I'm saying? Why would we pray anyway? The scripture tells us that we're to pray for people's healing. Why would we even do that if we don't believe he's going to do it? Stuffy people here will think me a sensationalist, but if you ever want me to pray with you for your healing, you come right up at the invitation or ask me to come over to your house. I'll bring pastors who will anoint you with oil and pray for your healing. We will put the question to God, believing he can and he will if it is his will. Is God dead, folks? Does somewhere he say in the New Testament, oh, by the way, I'm not going to do anything miraculous anymore. Can anyone show me that verse? Oh, that our faith would not be dead, that we would believe in the God who made this incredible world and made us and can do what he pleases. Number five, trust God to deliver from discouragement and depression. Verse number eight says, raiseth them that are bowed down. I personally believe the Lord allows much discouragement and depression in our lives for our own sanctification. I believe that many times it is his will. But you must know that there is hope after a while of suffering. For the Lord to raise you up out of that low condition. The scripture says in Psalm 112 verse 4, Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious, he is full of compassion and righteous. God will not allow you to be utterly destroyed by your depression. He is with you. He is by your side. He is teaching you no matter how you feel. Now, right now, in the middle of the the list here of when we can trust the Lord, right in the middle of the list, God tips his hand and he tells you why he is so trustworthy and why you can trust him so much and why he will answer you. Look at the end of verse number eight. It says this. It doesn't fit with the rest. You know, you ever, you ever watch Sesame Street? One of these things is not like the other. You know, some of you guys, are, your parents didn't let you watch Sesame Street. That's all right. You just missed out. All right, anyhow, most of the liberalism in my life I learned from Sesame Street. That, that's, I'm going down a wrong political track. All right. Notice what it says. This is, this is not like the rest of the list. The Lord loveth the righteous. It's a statement. It's a fact. And I believe it's the reason right stuck right in the middle of why he's trustworthy, why he even cares about your problems, why he cares about your needs, and why you can hope in him. You can trust him and know he will answer because he loves you if you are righteous. You know, you say, well, pastor, that certainly excludes me. Because, you can count me out, because I struggle with sin every day. When I read verses like this and I come across the word, I I appreciate the amens, but when I come across a verse like this, I see despair because of my total depravity. How could I ever be counted here? But please understand with me that this does not mean the Lord loves perfectly righteous people. Perfect people. No, we understand this first through the filter of the New Testament, through the foreshadowing of the Old Testament, that we can only be righteous and we are called righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ by faith. It is called imputed righteousness. That is not righteousness of performance. It's righteousness of declaration. It's a court kind of thing. It's a a declared righteousness. It's an earned on the cross righteousness for me. It's a substitute righteousness. Here's the word of God, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he, God the Father, hath made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, If your faith and trust is on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, count yourself in verse number 8c as the righteous whom the Lord loves. We are righteous by salvation, positional righteousness, not by performance. Praise the Lord a thousand times over. Blessed be the name of the Lord because none of this verse, none of this list would apply to anyone here if you're trying to be righteous on your own. You can never be included in this verse, never be included in any of these, these promises. I can never preach this sermon. We are made righteous through Jesus. We can't earn it by trying harder and harder and harder to be good. That's not what it's even talking about. We, but we are declared righteous through receiving Jesus as our Savior, and we are viewed and called righteous by God from that point on. And by the way, you want to know what a mark and a proof of that is? A mark and a proof of that is that when you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and you are born again, that God writes by the Holy Spirit his laws on your heart, and that you desire to pursue righteousness. 
That's how it comes out of you. It's not performance. We didn't get back to performance. It's just that will be your hope. That will be your desire. That's what you'll struggle after. You'll struggle against sin, towards righteousness. God loves, it says here, the end of verse number eight. This is why he's so dependable here. He loves the righteous. He loves that he has made you righteous. He, he is your Abba Father. He has called you righteous. In his eyes, you're as righteous as Jesus is. He will be your help and your hope. They can trust the Lord, the righteous. They can hope in him and find help in him as they call to him. You say, oh, pastor, I'm calling, I'm calling, and I don't see his help yet. And I'll say to you, call and wait, call and wait, call and wait. The answer's on the way. Call and wait. Say it with me, please. Call and wait, call and wait, call and wait. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Call and wait. Call and wait. The answer's on the way. When else can I trust God? What's the list? Trust God if you're a stranger. If you're a stranger. You say, that's weird. In verse 9, the Lord preserveth the strangers. It's the same word as I said, keepeth, guard to guard, to protect God has a soft spot in his heart for outsiders and for outcasts and people outside the, of the group. You say, praise the Lord, because I'm weird. He gave rules in the law to be hospitable to strangers. He extended grace to Gentiles outside of his chosen people. Christ is said to have suffered outside the gate. As a stranger, we are told to go outside the camp and bear his reproach. God has a soft spot for people who don't quite fit in. Perhaps you've never felt like you fit in anywhere. You're a loner. You feel rejected, a stranger, even in your own family, perhaps, your own school, or perhaps even this church. That's okay. God preserves strangers. <laughs> God keeps them. God protects them. God guards them. The scriptures promise. Cry to him to be your sufficient friend, your rock, your strength, your point of significance, your acceptance. If you're popular with God, who else do you need to be popular to? The scripture says if God be for us, who shall be against us? If you go through this entire life and you have only one friend and his name is Jehovah, you will have done very well. God preserves strangers, outcasts. I think that's precious. I, I really do. I think that's, that's wonderful. Because most of, a whole lot of our young people are searching for significance. And they need to find it not in beauty or not in other people or not in being popular or being, or being pencil thin or these kind of things. They need to find it in the Lord, their help. He loves them. He preserves them. He guards those who don't feel like they're included. The last one here, trust God if you're an orphan or a widow. Verse number nine says, he relieveth the fatherless and widow. The word relieve here literally means to repeat in protest or argument. As I searched out this word and I saw that it means to repeat over and over, I realized that it means the Lord argues for the orphan and widows to bring them relief. Wow, the Lord is the one who has picked up your case. The Lord is the one who is arguing, that is repeating arguments for you. We have a few orphans here today and a few widows, many widows. You can have an advocate. You have an advocate. It is the Lord who will cry out to help you. It is the Lord who is crying for you, who is watching over you. He is present, help. And defense for you. He knows your need. You're not alone, orphans. You're not alone, widows. The Lord is arguing for you. The Lord is picking up your case and arguing it and repeating it for you. In contrast to these seven situations to trust the Lord in and be assured of his help, the Lord makes it quite clear here at the end of the psalm that his promises are only for those that have found righteousness by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. He himself says a caveat, he says, I want to make, you sh make sure that you understand I'm not giving all these promises to everyone. Look at the end of verse number nine, it says, but the way of the wicked he turneth upside down. For those without the righteousness by faith on Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross and by his resurrection, for those who are not trusting him as savior, there is no help for you. I don't say that mean, I say that because I want you to run to Jesus. There is no promise that, that God will do all these things and be the God of Jacob to you. In fact, the, the Lord promises he will intentionally turn your world upside down 
until you repent and turn away from your sin and seek salvation and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And you can do that today. Believe that the man turned away from God at the point of creation, Adam and Eve, and from then on we've been sinners heading towards our sin. Believe that God in his love and compassion did something about it by sending his own perfect son down to die in your place on that cross and came up beating sin and death three days later out of the grave as he resurrected. Believe that is the truth and the only way of forgiveness and reconciliation with God and that you can be clean and clear and forgiven and saved forever and ever. Jesus died for your whole life sin on that cross. If you trust him as Lord and Savior, all will be forgiven. You will be made the righteous. You say, that's too good to be true. I need to do this. I need to do, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. We already talked about throwing away self-reliance. Salvation is only by God, is only by Jesus Christ. Run to Christ. The Lord is turning your world upside down and will, and especially will in eternity if you will not trust him as Savior. The chapter ends as it began in verse number 10. It says, The Lord shall reign forever, even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations, and it ends. Praise ye the Lord. Folks, this entire chapter gives us reason to worship the Lord because he is our help and our hope. Are you here today and you're trusting in yourself like Jacob or in people to help you and to hold you up? And you look for schemes, and you look for ways, and you force things, trust directly on the Lord. Cry to the Lord to be your help and hope. In faith, believe that he will work in your life the way that he wants to work. Praise him and worship him because he has helped you. And praise and worship him this morning because he will help you. Throw all plan B's away in your life. Trust the God of Jacob. Would you bow your heads, please, across the room? I have a few questions for you as we apply these things.